earthen dam design. In week one of this semester, we received a brief to design a dam slash berm to protect Thoman village from flooding. After we received our brief, we started straight away with a desktop investigation. We investigated both the proposed borrow site and the site in which the dam was to be constructed. When we arrived on site, we started by exploring for indicators of the soil beneath the surface. We know the proximity of the river and the wet soil loving plants growing in the area. When we broke ground, our assumptions of a wet soil were confirmed. We met both peat and water being held by the subsoil. Beneath the layer of peat, there was a sandy subsoil which was holding water. The soil felt gritty when rolled between the thumb and forefingers and flecks of sand could be seen in the soil. Once we excavated beyond 1.8 metres, we met what we believed to be clay. We then took our samples and brought them back to the lab for our initial testing. We began by taking moisture contents of all the samples we had excavated that day. We also then began preparing soils for our first laboratory experiment, a dry sieve test. From our dry sieve test, we were able to create a grading curve for our soil. However, because a dry sieve test is a test aimed at characterizing coarse soils, the grading curve proved inconclusive as we had a fine soil. We should have characterized the soil using a wet sieve test or a sedimentation test as there are silts and clay in our soil. Unfortunately, the wet sieve test and sedimentation tests were unavailable to us. We therefore carried on with our next characterization test for the soil, the liquid and plastic limit. We tested the plastic limit using the rolling thread method and we used a cone pentrometer to determine the liquid limit of the soil. From our plastic limit and liquid limit results, we were able to use Casagrande's chart to determine that we had a silt. While we were characterizing our soils in the lab, we were also designing our dam in the PBL sessions. We looked at several designs of dams, including dams that were not symmetrical and dams with advanced features, such as chimney drains. However, we decided to keep things simple and we settled on a symmetrical, homogeneous dam with the key beneath it. Now that we had decided on the general shape of the dam, we were able to begin designing the dam based on certain failure modes. Our first failure mode was overtopping. We designed against overtopping by looking at flood data and previous high floods that had occurred in the area. We then decided on a height and then added a freeboard to prevent overtopping. Our next point of concern was settlement. We were worried that if the slopes of our dam were too steep that the soil might creep and the dam would flatten out somewhat. This would affect our freeboard against overtopping. Therefore we had to choose stable slopes that would not allow the soil to creep. However, as slope stability is beyond our course, we turned to Craig's Soilums Mechanics for guidance on a suitable slope. It stated that a suitable slope for a homogeneous earthen dam would be 1 to 2.5. We then used some empiricism to confirm that this slope would be correct. We tipped soil out of a bucket in a heap in the lab and measured the angle that the soil made. We then found that the soil heap was a greater rise than 1 to 2.5. As the slope of the tipped heap of soil in the lab was greater than that recommended by Craig's, it confirmed for us that the slope recommended by Craig's would be suitable for the construction of our dam. By designing against the failure modes of overtopping and settlement, we had now arrived at the dimensions for our dam. Overtopping gave us the height of the dam, and settlement gave us the slopes. The slopes from the height then gave us the length of the dam. The depth of the key of our dam was ascertained from the trial bit. We decided to have the, da have the key go down 1.8 metres, as that is at the point of which we met the silty clay, which we believe was suitable for the construction of the dam. We then moved on to seepage. This meant we would have to draw flow nets for our dam. We drew our flow nets using Casagrande's method to determine the first flow line. However, when we did this for our dam, we seen that our flow line would emerge halfway up the downstream side of the dam. We knew this would cause issues regards piping and seepage. We therefore decided to install a drainage tub. We turned to several books for guidance on what geometry the drainage tub should be. And then we used Tarzaghi's equations to determine the grades of the materials that should be used within the drainage tow. From all this information, we were then able to size the drainage tow which we would use in our dam. Using Casagrande's method again, we then drew the first flow line of the dam with the drainage tow inserted. 
We then had to transform the flow nets to accurately calculate the seepage through the dam, as our dam is anisotropic. This means that water will flow more easily horizontally than it does vertically. The water flows horizontally more easily in our dam due to the preferential drainage paths created by the layers of compaction. We then re-transformed the transformed flow net back onto the scaled version of the dam. From this, we were able to draw the flow nets underneath the dam. When drawing the flow nets underneath the dam, we had to account for the fact that the flow lines would be going from one permeability to another. When a flow line leaves a permeability that is higher and transfers into a lower permeability, there is refraction. There is also refraction when a flow line leaves a low permeability and travels into a high permeability. The angle of refraction is calculated using this formula. Tan alpha 1 over tan alpha 2 is equal to the permeability 1 over permeability 2, where alpha 1 is the angle between the flow line and the normal, and alpha 2 is the angle between the flow line on exit of the low permeability and the normal. With the flow net now fully drawn to the best of our ability, we were able to calculate the seepage through the soil by using this flow net and the value for permeability that we got from our permeability test in the lab. Our attention then turned to our factor of safety for piping. The factor of safety for piping is found by dividing the critical hydraulic gradient by the actual hydraulic gradient. The critical hydraulic gradient is obtained using this formula. The specific gravity minus 1 over the voids ratio plus 1. Our critical hydra hydraulic gradient was 1.48. We obtained our value for specific gravity for use in this formula from our specific gravity experiment which we carried out in the lab. The actual hydraulic gradient is calculated from the flow net by dividing the change in head by the change in length. This is done by calculating the rise over the run of each square, thus giving a slope. This slope is then the actual hydraulic gradient. After we checked the squares of our flow net and inserted it into our formula for the factor of safety for piping, we found that our factor of safety against piping was 3. 3 would be too low a factor of safety against piping to use in practice. In practice, factors of safety of anything of the order from 6 to 8 are used. However, we put down our error in the calculation of factor of safety due to our inexperience at drawing flow nets. Uplift was also calculated using the flow net. By calculating the pore water pressure along certain points on the underside of the dam, we were able to calculate the total uplift profile acting beneath the dam. We then divided the downward pressure exerted by the whole weight of the dam divided by the uplift pressure to find a factor of safety against uplift. For our construction, we have specified that all topsoil should be removed until the sandy subsoil is clearly revealed. We have then specified that the silt material from the borrow site should be layered in 200mm lifts in accordance with guidance that we found in an FAO drainage and irrigation paper. Each lift should be rolled to a minimum of 1216kg per metre cubed of a dry density. This is 95% of our max dry density which we found by doing the proctor test in the lab. The dry density of 1216 should also be achieved within the moisture range of 9.5% moisture content and 20.5% moisture content. For quality control purposes, the dry density should be checked after each lift is finished. The dry density should be checked by using either the core cutter method or the sand replacement method.